it's just overlap a little bit of what we talked about last time. So we'll eventually or we get into that capillary exchange forces in just a second. But remember for the heart that there's an ECG electrical stimulation that we can pick up. And like I've said, you know, in lecture and lab, what you want to do is couple together, find the connection between what's happening in the cardiac conduction system, that's the electrical activity in the heart, and what's happening mechanically. So remember, electrical stimulation precedes what happens physically with the mechanical effects. So here, mechanically, we're talking about systole and diastole. The electronic conduction system, we're talking about kind of the electrical signal and how it filters through the heart to stimulate various parts of the heart. And we could pick up those electrical signals using a machine to generate a ECG trace. Okay, and so you want to know what each one of these is talking about. Now, I know Jack went into a lot more detail than what you guys need to know, but you want to start off with being able to connect what's happening electrically with what's happening physically, with the movement of blood through the heart. Any questions on that? I just wanted to make that clear to folks. Okay? All right, so we talked all already about blood vessels, and the smallest ones are those capillaries. And there's actually several different types of capillaries. We won't go into the different types, but as you might expect, for some of those capillaries, those endothelial cells, those, that epithelium that makes up the border of those blood vessels, they need to be a little bit more porous. So what are, you know, think back to our discussion that we had about thrombocytopenia. Where were platelets removed? What's, what organ or structure did that? Anybody remember? The spleen, right? And so in order to remove those formed elements, which are relatively large compared to, say, a protein, right, you need to have part of that blood vessels of that structure to be a bit more open to the blood tissue, right? They've got to have be a little bit more porous in order to remove them. So the spleen, for instance, has certain types of capillaries that are, have a little bit larger openings to be able to remove those formed elements. So anybody know another organ that does a lot of important removal of blood cells? The liver, right? That's another one, okay? So there's different types of capillaries depending upon what the purpose or the function is. So think back, structure, function, relationship. So we're going to talk in kind of broad terms of what happens with this capillary exchange, okay? And so we talked about the arteries and veins and the different, uh, you know, the uh, comparing the two. And we're going to zoom in on a capillary bed, right? So if we zoom in on a capillary bed, we already talked a little bit about where we might find some of these capillaries. But think back to being able to, say, increase perfusion of a tissue or decrease perfusion of a tissue, right? So what's a tissue where we can change how much blood flows to it? Anybody have any ideas? What's a tissue that we can change blood flowing to it? So think about the autonomic nervous system, the different divisions. So parasympathetics involved with, it's a phrase that sums up what that does. So rest and digest, right? So here, where is blood going to increase, or where are you going to get increased blood flow towards if we have a parasympathetic being activated? So intestines, right? Okay. What about sympathetic? Where are we going to increase blood flow towards in that case? So extremities, and if you're trying to run as fast as you can away from that bear, so are we, what tissue are we using to run? Yeah, the muscle, skeletal muscle, right? So there's some ability to change blood flow and therefore change perfusion of different areas. One of the ways to do that, all right, is to increase or decrease the flow to some of these capillary beds. And one of the ways to do that is to increase or decrease 
the diameter opening towards the capillary beds. And so there's a smooth muscle, a sphincter muscle, that can be open or closed to increase perfusion to that tissue by increasing flow to certain capillary beds. Everybody follow me on this? So here, if that, if you want to decrease flow to that capillary bed, you close off the kind of off ramps to that capillary bed. And so here, in that case, the blood, for the most part, is going to flow by or you have decreased perfusion of that capillary bed. If you want to increase perfusion to that capillary bed, you can relax the smooth muscle that makes up that sphincter muscle and allow more blood to flow in. Everybody follow me on this? It's kind of like regulating on and off ramps, okay, to capillary beds. Okay, so the main type of epithelium that we have lining capillaries is the simple squamous. Why simple squamous? Why is that important? Think about what's the purpose to have happen at capillaries. We are going to have diffusion going on. Is that going to happen in only one direction? No. Right? What type of things are we delivering to tissues from the blood? Oxygen is an important one. Anything else? So nutrients, right? What are some things that are going to be taken up? Some waste products. So carbon dioxide, yeah, is a big one. And there's other metabolites too, right? So we need to make sure that we can do this exchange with as little uh, barrier, as few barriers as possible. So if you think back to histology, which cells are really thin? It's the squamous cells, right? And then which one has a single layer versus multiple layers? Simple. All right, okay, so talked about these capillary beds and there are sphincters to shunt blood, kind of like regulating off ramps there. The arterial end delivers the nutrients, so that's going to be more this area here. And then the venous end is going to be there to take up waste products, metabolites from the surrounding tissue. All right, so we call this the arterial end and then we have the venule end. All right, so there's two major forces involved. One is called a hydrostatic force. The other one is the osmotic force. So here, the hydrostatic force, that's as if you're pushing down on the plunger of a syringe, right? That's going to be a hydrostatic force. So what's a major pump that's generating the hydrostatic force? So so what's a major pump for the cardiovascular system? The heart, right? So that's where we're generating a lot of that hydrostatic force, okay? Now, what's generating that osmotic force? It's going to be the solute concentration. Remember, the water is going to flow towards the higher solute concentration, okay? So here, if we look at the arterial end of this, our hydrostatic force is going to be pushing out at about 35 millimeters of mercury. And then we have a osmotic force of 25 millimeters of mercury pulling things into the blood. What's the net if we add those up? Which direction are things going to go? If we have 35 pushing out and 25 being pulled in. What's the net filtration movement there? Is that going to be going into the blood or out of the blood? We add those two forces up. So which one's greater? Going out, right? We have 35 here of a hydrostatic force and only 25 of osmotic force, right? So one of the ways to think about this hydrostatic and osmotic is that hydrostatic is kind of more the pushing out of the blood and the osmotic's more of the pulling into the blood. All right? Everybody with me on this? Okay, so 
these two forces kind of battle to each other. So you want to figure out which one's going to win out. We add them up. What's the net effect of these two forces? So be mindful that we're talking here on the arterial end, right? So hopefully this makes sense. Because if we want to deliver nutrients, do we want to have a force that's going to be pushing things out from the blood? Yes. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. Now, remember when we go from the arterial end to the venous end, right, we decrease pressure, right? So take a look at what happens to the hydrostatic pressure. Okay, I'll get to your question in just a second, Sabrina. Right, so we go from 35, and then eventually we get to 25, and then at the very venual end here, okay, we get down to 18. So now, which direction is favored? We add up the forces involved here. It's the net filtration. So are we pushing things out or pulling things into the blood? Pulling them in, right? So now here the osmotic force, right, is going to be more dominant than the hydrostatic force, right? Which means that waste, metabolites, and so forth, which direction are they going to move? We're going to go from tissues to where? Into the blood, right? So here, we're just adding up these filtration forces, right? Here, the net filtration force is delivering things from the blood to tissues. The net filtration force that's happening here is delivering things from the tissues back to the blood compartment. Everybody following me on that? Okay. It's the hydrostatic force and the osmotic force, right? What controls the osmotic force is the concentration of solids in the blood, right? And to some extent, it doesn't change as much, but also solids in the surrounding tissue. Sorry, go ahead, Sabrina. Um, what exactly is the mercury? Oh, the mercury is just a way to measure the um, the force, the um, uh, pressure. So you've heard of you know um, uh, you know the barometer readings are measured in millimeters of mercury. So there's not mercury in the system, hopefully not, right? All that's doing is you're just using that as a metric for these pressure forces. Okay. So if we can measure in atmospheres, there's other units that can be used. It's just a unit of pressure force. Good question. Thanks for asking. All right? Okay, so like I said, major thing that drives the osmotic force are concentration of solids. Let's say that someone is hyperglycemic. What does that mean? Blood sugar is too high. It's elevated. What do you think that's going to do to this osmotic force, this pulling force, pulling things from tissues into the blood? Is that going to go up or down? So what have we done to the amount of solutes in the blood? Do we increase them or decrease them if someone's hyperglycemic? They went up, right? That could go up a lot. If we increase the number of solutes, remember, water's going to go towards the higher concentration of solutes. So what's going to happen to that osmotic force? Is that going to go up or down? So here, remember, the osmotic force is pulling things into the blood from the surrounding tissue. So is that osmotic force, that pulling action, going to go up or down? So you think, what do you think, Sabrina? It's going up. Anybody else have any other ideas? How many folks agree with Sabrina that it's going to go up? Absolutely. It's going to go up quite a bit, right? So it's as if, you know, you dumped a bunch more salt right, in one compartment, you increase that concentration of solute, that's going to pull more water.
towards it, right? So we're going to be pulling more fluid into the blood. What's that going to do to the volume of blood, you think? It's going to go up, right? What do you think that's going to do to blood pressure? It's going to go up, right? So someone who's hyperglycemic, right, who has sustained episodes of hyperglycemia, what type of disease would we classify that as? Can't control blood sugar very much. Diabetes, right? So if they can't control their blood sugar levels and they are hyperglycemic glycemic for extended periods of time, right? What would you expect? Would you expect to find them to have elevated blood pressure? Probably, right? What about urine formation in the kidneys? So we, one of the things is, remember that the pressure of the blood is going to increase the amount of filtrate formed and what is that going to do to the amount of urine formed? Is that going to go up? Yeah, absolutely, right? So one of the hallmarks that originally came about with people that were diabetic is that they had increased frequency of urination. One of the reasons for this is because of having elevated solute, particularly glucose in this case, in the blood. Now go ahead, Charles. Yes, it, absolutely, and so, you know, you're absolutely right. It's trying to maintain homeostasis because what do we say was causing the high blood pressure? It was elevated blood volume. So how does the body try to decrease blood volume? It tries to decrease that by generating more urine that can be then excreted from the body. It's a homeostatic mechanism. Unfortunately, it doesn't work too well, you know, because you still have the elevated blood sugar, right? So it's trying to compensate, absolutely, but it's a challenge to do so because the root of the problem is still there. Everybody following me on that? Okay. All right. How do we feel about uh, exchange across a capillary bed? The forces. Pushing force is hydrostatic. The holding force into the blood is osmotic. Okay. And so you want to figure out, okay, well, if I start messing around with, say, the ability of cardiac output, we could be adjusting which of those forces. So cardiac output is going to be affecting hydrostatic, right? And what example did we just talk about for affecting, say, the osmotic? So what disease? Diabetes. All right, good. All right, making sure you guys are still there. All right, so we could affect add other solids other than glucose that could do the same issues, right? Can affect the system in the same way. Everybody follow me on this? Okay. All right. So like we said, you know, the blood pressure on the walls goes down. So as we go from arterioles to capillaries to venules here, right? Okay. So not surprisingly, we start getting that exchange that happens when we look at, uh, you know, the capillaries. Okay. All right. So blood pressure. Just as a quick recap, we talked a little bit about this already, but we have peripheral resistance and cardiac output, right? The product of those two is going to be equaling blood pressure, right? So blood pressure is a combination of cardiac output and peripheral resistance. Peripheral resistance we talked about, right? So the uh, length of the vessels, right, that the uh, blood has to go through, the thickness of blood, the viscosity, and then a big one is this whole idea of changing the diameter of the blood vessels. Remember, if we double the radius, we decrease the resistance by 1 16th. So changing the radius is inversely proportional to the resistance to the fourth power. So changing the diameter or the radius of blood vessels has a huge impact on peripheral resistance. And it's a major way the body 
tries to control blood pressure through peripheral resistances by changing the diameter of some of these resistance vessels, the arterioles. Okay. Is that making sense to folks? So that's a really important point. We're going to come back to that. Okay, so we talked about cardiac output. This is basically a product of, all right, how much blood is being ejected per beat and how many beats are there in a minute? Multiply those together and you can get the volume ejected per minute by the heart. And specifically, we're interested in what gets ejected from the left ventricle. Why the left ventricle? Why are we interested in that? Where's that blood going? So everywhere, systemically, right? That's why we're generally more interested in the stroke volume coming from the left side of the heart. And so here, this is pretty much what I just told you, the cardiac outputs, the heart rate times stroke volume. So at rest, you can figure it out, and then vigorous exercise, which is the maximum cardiac output, generally four to five times. Um, it can get fairly high in those that are athletes and well-trained. If you subtract the two, you can get what's called the cardiac reserve. So for individuals, you know, that are uh, exceptionally uh, well-trained athletes, they have a great cardiac reserve. Where you subtract cardiac output of the maximum cardiac output, you subtract the resting cardiac output from that. All right? Making sense of folks? All right, so we kind of did this. I didn't tell you some of these terms yet, but remember that cardiac output's a product of stroke volume and heart rate. Stroke volume is end diastolic volume minus end systolic volume. And if we think about things that factor into this, there's three things. You're going to hear these terms if you go into the healthcare field. One's called preload, the other one's afterload, and also contractility. Preload is how much venous return. It's more about the venous system. So if we increase venous return to the heart, we increase the amount of blood going towards the heart, then there's a good chance that we're going to increase the amount of blood that fills the ventricles, right? So at the end of diastole, we could have elevated volume in the ventricles because we had more blood return from the venous system. So increased venous return, if you go back to that slide where I showed all those factors that aid venous return, one of the major ones was skeletal muscle pump, right, the milking action. So if we have increased milking action, we increase blood going back to the heart. If we have more blood going back to the heart, there's a greater chance that we're going to have a group increased end diastolic volume, right? And if we increase end diastolic volume, what's that going to do to stroke volume? Should go up, right? If we increase stroke volume, what's that doing to cardiac output? Should be going up, right? So all of this, we could say, is increasing the preload. Increasing the preload, right? Okay. Now, after load, does the pressure the ventricles have to overcome to eject blood? So think about the left ventricle. It's going to eject blood throughout the uh, rest of the system of the body. What if we suddenly decrease the diameter of those peripheral vessels? Is that force that those ventricles have to overcome increase? Is that going to increase or decrease, do you think? So at increase a lot, right? Because now the heart has to pump even more strongly in order to eject blood. There's a good chance that it does, doesn't eject as much blood as it did before, that decrease in diameter of those peripheral vessels. So this force that the ventricles have to overcome to eject blood is called the afterload, right? Think about if someone, if we had a blood vessel, and we had things accumulate on the surface of that, the inner diameter of the blood vessel, so that the blood vessel diameter 
through which blood could flow decreases. Right? What's that doing to the afterload? So we're decreasing the effective diameter through which blood can flow. Right? What's that doing to afterload? Is it increasing it or decreasing it? What do you guys think? Yeah, going up a lot, right? So here we're saying that things are accumulating so that the actual uh, effective diameter through which blood can flow starts decreasing, becomes narrower, right? So there's diseases out there. One of you got one of those you guys looked at in the discussion homework that decreases that diameter of peripheral blood vessels and therefore increases afterload. The last one is contractility. And contractility is going to be for every contraction, for a set contraction, the force of the contraction changes. And so here the sympathetic nervous system can affect contractility strength, right? So here, if we have a contraction that's stronger, are we ejecting more blood from the heart? What do you guys think? Absolutely, right? And so here, what does that mean? Well, if we increase contractility, then we're ejecting more blood. There's less blood left in the ventricles, which means that we're increasing stroke volume, right? Because end systolic volume is just how much blood's left after that contraction, right? Does that make sense to folks? So here, the sympathetic nervous system can increase contractility and heart rate. How do people feel about preload, afterload, and contractility? So preload's about the venous system returning blood to the heart. Afterload is how much force the heart has to overcome to eject blood. And contractility is how much strength or the, you know, for every beat, how much strength is in each one of those heartbeats? Is that making sense to folks, right? So there's certain chemicals out there that can do this. So folks that are in the healthcare field may have heard of digitalis. All right, okay. All right, so these re reflexes, I'll just go through the two of them real quick, and we'll take a break and get into our discussion. You've seen these already in the lab, and we've talked a little bit about them. But if we have an increase in blood pressure, right? Increase in blood pressure, that's going to cause stretching in certain parts, of certain blood vessels, right? And so the stretching is going to be an indicator of increased blood pressure. So what type of device do we use to measure atmospheric pressure? We know. Barometer, right? So these are called baroreceptors. Same prefix, barometer and baro. Baroreceptors, right? They are mechanical receptors because they detect the stretching of the blood vessels. Because if you increase pressure, you increase the stretch. Now that signal is going to be sent to the part of the brain, the brain stem, that integrates all this information. And remember, the initial stimulus was increased blood pressure. So overall, the effect should be to try to decrease that. And remember, blood pressure is a combination of heart, of cardiac output and peripheral resistance, right? Those two things. So one of the things that we can do to decrease cardiac output, what could we do to heart rate to do that? We want to increase heart rate or decrease it? Decrease heart rate. So that's one thing. Okay? Decrease heart rate. If we're decreasing heart rate, that's happening through the vagus nerve of the parasympathetic nervous system, right? Rest and digest. Okay? Now, what about peripheral resistance? Do we want to increase or decrease peripheral resistance? Yeah, we want to decrease peripheral resistance, which means what are we doing to the blood vessel diameter? Are we making them smaller or larger? Should be making them larger, right? So here we do, we have vasodilation that goes on, right? If we dilate, that means that we're making that diameter larger. And so that means our peripheral resistance is going down, 
So we've affected cardiac output and peripheral resistance. We have a huge effect on blood pressure. Is that making sense to folks? Right? Our initial stimulus was elevated blood pressure, and the overall effect uh, was to try to decrease that elevated blood pressure through um, decreasing heart rate and decreasing peripheral resistance. Now, this is kind of a short-term way to regulate blood pressure. We'll talk about some more long-term mechanisms on Thursday. All right, let's talk about the opposite. What if we have decreased blood pressure? Those baroreceptors are inhibited. What are we going to do to the heart rate? If we have decreased blood pressure, what do we want to do to the heart rate? We want to elevate it, right? So what, what part of the autonomic nervous system are we going to be stimulating possibly? Sympathetic. Which branch of the autonomic nervous system are we going to inhibit? So parasympathetic, right? So here, the cardioinhibitory center, which sends out that signal via the vagus nerve, which is part of the parasympathetic, gets inhibited. We stimulate the sympathetic. What does that do to heart rate? Increases heart rate. What do we do to peripheral resistance? We want to increase peripheral resistance. So here, the diameter we want to decrease, right? Okay. And so both of those combined to try to maintain blood pressure, right? And remember, these are just short term. Okay. All right, so let's leave it there. And let's take five minutes. And then after the five minutes, we'll have some discussion, you know, about the, uh, uh, you know, blood vessel and heart homework, okay? Um, and so feel free to talk with neighbors around you about the answers that you guys got.